Mr. McCoy back with part six of Mystery of the Egyptian Scroll. As you recall, Zet and Kat were visiting Pattis and Anna. Anna headed down to the kitchen. Look at this, Kat, Zet said, pulling his sister over to Pattis's work area. Zet glanced at Pattis's face. What are you working on in here? Is that paper you're making? Pattis caught on and quickly nodded. I like to do a little paper making of my own up here to earn extra. In addition to growing the plants, of course, I'd make more of it, but we don't have the space. I've always wondered how it was made, Zet said. Uh, haven't you, Cat? She swallowed, then nodded, stepping closer to the giant sheet on the floor. Do you want me to show you how it's done? Pattis asked. That would be great, Zet said. Pattis led them to the corner where several tall stalks of papyrus rested against the wall. He explained that he first peeled away the outer fibers to get the soft pith inside. Using a blade, he peeled one a little to show them. The pith inside was pale yellowish white and much softer. Then I cut the pith core in long strips. I make them as thin as possible. Of course, the center strips are the best because they're the widest, but I try to use as much as possible. The next step after the strips had been cut was to soak them in water. That's what's in the buckets? Kat asked. Her color had begun to return. He nodded. Just then, Anna appeared with the snacks. Don't bore them with that, husband, she said. He grinned. <laughs> they asked. He's not boring us, Kat said, accepting a cup of water. Zet took a seed cake, suddenly starving. These are delicious, and they really were, and not just because he was starving. Anna was an excellent baker. Anna smiled. It's the honey, she confided. A trader from upriver brings it to barter for the reeds. After they'd eaten, and they'd all eaten a little, Pattis carried on with his demonstration. Now, I lift the slices out like so and lay them across the floor. As you can see, they're very soft and spongy. And almost transparent, Kat said. Exactly, that's what we want. Sometimes I cut them to the length I want at this point, but usually I just pound them flat like so. He hammered them with the mallet. The slices grew flatter and wider. The last step is to simply to lay a number of them side by side in a giant sheet, overlapping just a bit. Then I add a second layer at right angles to the first. When that's done, I pound the whole sheet and leave it to dry for another six days or so. The sugar inside the plant makes it stick together. This big piece is around half dry. When it's ready, I'll cut it up into a dozen or more sheets. That's a lot of work, Kat said. No wonder papyrus is so expensive. Pat has nodded. Speaking of papyrus, Zed said, we found out what's on the stolen scroll. So what do you think's going to happen when Pattis hears this? Share with your fellow listener. Zet's words rang in the stillness of the workroom. As if unable to believe that Zet had somehow seen the stolen papyrus, Pattis and Anna stared at him with their mouths wide. Pattis finally swallowed. But how did you manage that? Is that why you were being chased? Yes, Zet said. He rubbed his neck for a minute, wondering where to begin. Finally, he started at where they'd seen the thin man on the road. He described the chase through the streets. Cat, back to her old self again, chimed in, filling in bits. When Zet described sneaking through the door into the sacred temple of Amahotep, Anna and Pattis gasped. What choice did we have? We had to follow him. You wouldn't have gotten me to sneak in there. No way, Anna said. Her cheeks were flushed, her eyes wide with excitement. I would have been terrified beyond belief. So what did it look like in there, uh, the temple of Amahotep? Uh, think of it, she said, turning to her husband. He made an impressed sort of grunt and nodded for Zet to go on. It was all shadows with enormous pillars, a forest of them in stone, and all carved with spells, Cat added. And since we're still here, I suppose the gods must not have been too angry with us. No, I suppose not. Anna agreed. We sneaked up and heard them talking. The thin man and the big one, and the big man is the high priest. A shocked silence filled the workroom. The high priest, Pata said. It gets worse. Zet took a deep breath, thinking of what they'd learned about the stolen papyrus and about how they'd been chased all the way to their stall. 
He picked at the thin strip of papyrus Pattis had pounded as an example of how paper was made. That scroll he stole is much more important than you'll ever guess. What is it? The original building plans for Pharaoh's palace. They're going to sell them tomorrow. Pattis stood and began pacing the room. Do you know what this means? Kat said, that whoever buys them will know the layout of Pharaoh's home. They'll be able to get in there and steal things, the sacred relics. I'm afraid it might be worse than that, Pattis said. It may be about theft, you are right, but if that were the case, they'd more likely spend their efforts trying to rob the tombs. That's where the true wealth lies, buried with the Pharaohs who've come before. He picked up one of the heavy mallets, turning it over in his hands. Then what? Kat said. I think the most likely reason someone wants it is to make an attempt on Pharaoh's life. Kat sucked in her breath. You think someone wants to kill Pharaoh? Set said. Given that the high priest is involved, I fear this is much larger than a simple robbery. There have been rumors of unrest in the royal house. I think it's possible we put ourselves right in the middle of a plot to overthrow the throne. The delicious seed cake Zed had so greedily eaten now formed a lump in his stomach. Anna nodded. I agree. That palace must have all sorts of secret tunnels in it, ways for Pharaoh to get around undisturbed, shortcuts and things. Uh, no doubt tunnels that go straight into his sleeping chamber. If someone else had access to them, it would be easy to kill him and get away. Not only is Pharaoh in deep trouble, we are too, Zet said. They came to our stall looking for us. Cat tugged on her braids. Uh, he could see beads of sweat forming on her forehead. Oh no, Anna said. That's why we ran, and I'm sure the thin man saw us, and he knows now that we were the ones in the temple, that we overheard them talking. Zet pushed his fingers through his short hair. It was just hitting home now, the depth of the trouble they were in. We should go to the Medjays, Kat said in a trembling voice. They'll know what to do, won't they? Can't we just tell them everything and we'll be safe? Pattis shook his head. Uh, he went to the roof hatch and opened it to let out some of the stifling air. But there was no breeze and it made little difference. I don't think they'd believe us, Pattis said. That's the problem. We could tell them, but it would be our word over that of the high priest. Who do you think would win? The question wasn't even worth answering. But what can we do? Cat cried, there must be something. Zet was afraid his sister was about to start sobbing. He went and put an arm around her. She wrapped her arms around her knees and leaned into him. He thought of their abandoned stall. He loved that stall. Until this afternoon, it felt like home. Until this afternoon, it was their family's means to get by in the world, to keep hunger at bay, to keep a roof over their heads. What would they do without it? What would they tell their father? That he gambled his family's safety away over the hope of some copper Devon? We'll make it, Zet said, as much to convince her as himself. We'll figure this out. You said they were going to sell the scroll, Pallas said. Let's keep our heads here. Did you get any more information on that? Bleary-eyed, Zet looked up. Yes, yes, we did. Uh, they said they were meeting someone tomorrow night at a place called the Rose Bar. Zet got to his feet. That's it, he cried, suddenly energized. Don't you see? All we need to do is find the Rosebark and bring some Medjay there. They'll be caught red-handed, and we're safe. The Rosebark? I've never heard of such a place, Anna said. They looked to Pattis, who shrugged. Neither have I. But it doesn't mean we can't find it. We have until tomorrow night, right? Cat nodded. The color had begun to return to her cheeks. The sunlight that once shone through the overhead slats was quickly fading. Soon, they'd be safe to leave. They discussed a plan for tomorrow. Everyone would spend the day discreetly searching for and inquiring about the rosebark. Anna offered more water and asked if they'd like to stay for dinner. Zet and Cat shook their heads. We'd better go. Before they could finish speaking, Pattis leaped up and grabbed Zet by the shoulders. His face had gone white. His fingers were like vice grips. Does anyone else at the market know where you live? Uh, I'm not sure. Think, Pattis said and shook him. Do they or don't they? Maybe I never thought about it. Zet stopped. A sick feeling twisted his stomach. Mother, he gasped and tore.
core for the stairs. So what do you predict is gonna happen now? Share with your fellow listener. Zet, Cat, and Patus ran from the house. They tore through the streets, all caution gone. It may have only been a few minutes. To Zet, it seemed to take forever. Lamplight flickered through the familiar, cozy open window ahead. The three of them slowed, found an alcove, and pressed themselves to the wall. The front door was shut, which Zet took as a good sign. When his mother crossed in front of the window, her movements calm and composed, he sucked in a great breath of air. They're not here, he said. Pattis said, which means you're safe for tonight. With the market empty and the vendors home for the evening, the, the high priest and his men will have to wait for morning to inquire about your address. What a relief. Thanks for coming with us, Kat said, and for keeping us safe today. He patted her on the back. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Tomorrow we'll find this rose bark. We'll tell the Med Jay and it will be over. It'll all be over, I promise. Thank you, she said. Pattis stood watch until they reached the front door. As Zet stepped inside, he glanced out before closing it. Their friend waved goodnight and disappeared into the darkness. Kat ran to her mother and threw her arms around her waist. Hello, their mother said with a smile. It's late, I was getting worried, but what's all this? She cried as Kat stifled a sob. I just, I, I missed you, that's all, Kat said, wiping her nose and smiling up at their mother. Well, I missed you too, sweet one. She stroked Kat's braids. I think you've been working too much, haven't you? I know it's a burden on your children. I wish it weren't so, but I'm proud of you and your father would be too. Zet stared at the floor, unable to agree, but not wanting her to see his face. Let's have dinner and you can tell me all about your day, she said. I'll just check on the baby, wash up and then sit down at the table. I'll be there. They washed in silence in the kitchen. Kat looked exhausted. Zet felt exhausted. Let's try not to worry mother, he said. She nodded. He wondered if they'd fool their mother. At least he'd regained his appetite. That would make her happy. She liked to see them eat well. At the table, he put on a happy face and Cat did the same. Aren't you going to eat? Zet asked his mother after he and Cat had been served. She waved a gentle hand. Her comforting motherly perfume smelled faintly of baking and flowers. I'm not hungry, she said. You go ahead. Did you eat earlier? Kat asked, putting down her piece of bread. Oh, I had a little here and there. I was baking, she said vaguely. Mother, what's going on? Please, we want to know. She dusted the table, smoothing her fingers over it, despite the fact it was clean. Children, I don't suppose you made any trades today, she said finally. I'm sorry, Zet said quietly. We didn't. She nodded. That bread you are eating, I used the last of the wheat to bake it. When both Zet and Kat dropped their bread on the table and looked at her in astonishment, she stretched out her arms. Come here, she said. The two of them sidled up to her and she gathered them close. Zet leaned into her side, wishing he were four again and that his father was home and that he was still running around clamoring to go outside and play. I only tell you this because you ask and because you are old enough to know. You are out there running the stall, so I know you realize this might be coming. She stroked Zet's back. But we'll get by. Something will change. The gods won't forsake us. The sound of her voice and the steady warmth of her hand began to comfort him. Just for now, he'd allow himself to believe they were safe. Just for now, he'd let himself relax. Then let's share what we have, he said. We'll make a feast of it together. And somehow, once they'd divided the food between the three of them, there was more than enough. They ate and talked of old times. They shared stories about their father and all the wonderful, funny things he liked to do. Their mother told them each about what Zet and Cat had been like when they were small children and the mischief they got into, which got gales of laughter out of them. Despite the hard times, despite their father being gone, it was one of the best evenings Zet could ever remember. It had almost felt as though their father were here with them. On the roof, he lay and stared at the stars. I've been thinking about tomorrow, he told Kat. She propped herself onto one elbow. It's not safe for mother to stay here, he said. What should we tell her? How can we explain? Here's my plan, and I think it's a good one. We need to convince mother that you and she should spend the day together with the baby out of the house. It's been too long since you've had time together. We'll tell her that I'll man the stall. 
She knows we're not busy, and then while you're out with her, you can ask around about the rose bark. Do you think she'll say yes? She has to. She can't stay here, Cat. I know. Plus, if you and I split up, we'll have more chances of finding someone who's heard of the rose bark and will be less recognizable, apart. Uh, they'll be looking for two of us. I'll do it, and I think it's a good idea, she said. She rolled onto her side. Now I need to sleep. After everything, I'm just so tired. He bid her good night and rolled over himself. Despite his exhaustion, he doubted he'd be able to sleep, but he drifted off shortly after and awoke with a start as the first rays of Ra shot over the horizon. Bleary-eyed, he stumbled downstairs to find Cat in the kitchen talking with their mother. I think it's a wonderful idea, their mother said, beaming. A whole day with my daughter? As long as Zet doesn't mind. I don't, Zet said, grinning. From the pile of cushions on the floor, Apu gurgled and laughed and clapped his hands. Cat went over and swept him up. And you agree, she cried, swinging him in a circle. Since this was currently Apu's favorite thing, to be swung around and around, he shrieked in delight. Zet took a turn, too. When he finally handed his baby brother over to their mom so she could get the child ready for his outing, Cat pulled him aside. You're not going back to the stall today, are you? She whispered. How do you think Zet will reply? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of Mystery of the Egyptian Scroll. Zed and Cat faced off in the kitchen. She looked furious that he'd even think of going back to the stall. And we'll find out what happens next as Mystery of the Egyptian Scroll continues. <laughs>